Welcome to Alaska Weather, a production of Alaska Public Media and the National Weather Service, Alaska Region. Produced and broadcast daily from the studios of KAKM, Alaska Weather provides complete forecasts, public, marine, and aviation for all of Alaska. Alaska Weather is made possible by the following sponsors. Sometimes it's a struggle to get our kids moving, but the Healthy Futures Challenge helps our whole family be more physically active. Now my kids ask to get out and play because they're committed to the challenge. Our family goes sledding, or we go for a walk and toss the football. Now when my daughter sees me grab my running shoes, she asks if she can come too. The kids are trying new activities and they feel more confident. Find out if your child's school is participating in the Healthy Futures Challenge. Inspire your kids to get out and play every day. The National Weather Service. And good Tuesday, everyone. I'm meteorologist Dave Snyder with the National Weather Service. It's the 10th of June already, and as always, we encourage you to stay up to date with the very latest weather information, whether you're doing that with your NOAA weather radio or the Marine Band, perhaps you're doing it from the Internet, weather.gov slash Alaska or arh.noaa.gov. You can give us a call on the Alaska Weather Information line at 800-472-0391. Find weather information all day long on Twitter, on Facebook under NWS Alaska, and on YouTube. You'll get the shorter version of the afternoon broadcast around 3.45, 4 o'clock or so on YouTube. If you search for NWS Anchorage or NWS Fairbanks, you'll find those shorter podcast type uh, forecast reviews of the surface weather charts there. It's about two to three minutes long, so it shouldn't tax your uh, internet uh, bill too much there to check those out. And then after this show with our partner alaskapublic.org, you can watch the entire Alaska weather show as you like there uh, from their webpage or on YouTube simply by searching for AKWX TV. On with the weather. Now, fire danger, of course, uh, has been lessening somewhat across a large part of South Central and the interior, but it's not gone just yet. We've seen quite a bit of rain moving up the Cook Inlet and across South Central, reaching the Alaska Range and producing showers and thunderstorms across a large part of the Brooks Range, uh, the Yukon Flats, and certainly into the Yukon itself. However, a fire danger remains high across parts of the Tanana Valley and the Yukon Valley and across areas west of Glen Allen and across some of the higher terrain there and across South Central. So fire danger is not over yet and uh, crews are still battling many wildfires around the state, uh, one of those now uh, around the interior. And we'll continue to watch for updates along uh, that from the National Weather Service there in Fairbanks. Here's a look out across the Bering Sea and several things to point out here. A broad area of low pressure continues in the upper atmosphere and at the surface it's supporting a number of waves. One of those latching onto Pacific moisture moving that into the YK Delta and Bristol Bay. And that will continue its motion through the rest of the week keeping the west coast fairly unsettled. And that also pushes moisture into the interior even further and that produces a better chance for showers and thunderstorms there. On the north and west side of that is colder air wrapping around. Uh, that is breaking up some of the ice here across the Bering Strait with the warmer air moving in, but there's still plenty of cold wrapping into this, so uh, conditions are not warming up uh, very, very quickly across the western parts of the Bering. But across the northern parts of the Arctic that are a little bit closer to some of the warmth, we're getting that transitional type weather pattern where we're getting a little bit of rain, but also mixing in with snow. Uh, earlier today, a freezing rain advisory was allowed to expire across the Chukchi Sea coast, but there still may be some issues where rain and snow mix together uh, in the next 24 hours there. Here's a look at the visible satellite picture and you're looking at low clouds across parts of uh, the Yukon. A little bit of sunshine uh, popped into place there uh, north of Northway all the way to Eagle today and things warmed up fairly quickly. You're noticing a lot of ripples in kind of the cloud pattern here. That is a lot of a uh, low convective clouds or cumulus clouds. Watch as they begin to spiral here across the YK and into the lower and middle Yukon Valley. We've got a wave of low pressure here. We've got another one right here across the uh, uh, open waters of the Gulf, another stronger structure there well south of the Gulf of Alaska and then underneath that upper level low that we saw another one way out by Shimya and there's many more to pick out and choose here as you watch the loop one more time. What we did see by late afternoon was thunderstorms developing here across the Alaska range. A lot of the cloud cover here across the Yukon was uh, turning into some thunderstorm activity and some of that also across the Brooks range. Pretty much a repeat of what we're seeing yesterday, maybe not quite as intense or widespread. 
uh, but the overall pattern uh, through the next 24 hours probably won't change a whole lot. And again, a lot of moisture still working in with a frontal boundary working itself north of the Pribilof to uh, Nunavak Island into the YK. And, and again, more rain across the west coast, Norton Sound, and probably the lower and even middle Yukon valleys in the next 24 hours. Here's a look at the surface weather chart. Uh, high pressure sitting up across the Chukchi Sea coast is allowing a few areas of snow to form around uh, Kaktovik and westward toward Prudhoe Bay and Dead Horse and also around Point Hope and Point Lay. A frontal boundary is moving northward here toward the Pribilof, and again, that seems to be falling apart there, but there's still enough upper level support uh, to keep the rainfall going. Uh, a few showers and thunderstorms across the higher train, and then again, widespread rain, uh, mostly in uh, either light to moderate rain showers there, uh, continuing across the YK from Norton Sound southward toward Bristol Bay with high pressure trying to hold on and keep things settled across southeast. We've seen a few showers pop up across the, the coastal areas around Sitka and northward, but most areas in southeast seem to be dry by early afternoon. Low pressure will drag in some slightly cooler air south of the Brooks Range later tonight. That will keep the risk for isolated thunderstorms possible across the, uh, the flats around the Yukon and also across uh, the eastern areas of uh, the Copper River Basin all the way up toward Northway and Eagle. Here's our front still holding on just a little bit longer. That broad west and southwesterly flow working across the central and western chain will keep things unsettled there. And the overall structure of the upper level wind flow will keep wet air wrapping into the YK and Bristol Bay as we go through tonight and into tomorrow. Watch for a few showers in southeast tomorrow. Most of that looks to be a little bit further south than north. Uh, rainfall still possible around South Central. A lot of that will really be focused on the higher terrain, including the Talkeetnas, the Chugach Range, and of course the Alaska Range. A little more opportunity for showers and thunderstorms across parts of the middle and upper Yukon Valley tomorrow and the Brooks Range. Uh, the Arctic Coast, generally speaking, looks pretty dry. You may run into a patch of light snow or even some of that mixed in with rain, but looks like more clouds and precipitation for your Wednesday. So if you're looking for some slightly drier weather, you may find it there. With high pressure north of St. Lawrence Island, uh, look for that to feed into a trough of low pressure working itself northward across uh, the YK and into the Kuskokwim Bay area. Low pressure working across the central chain also stirring up a better chance for some rain across the eastern chain, the Alaska Peninsula, and Kodiak Island still looking a little bit wet. By Thursday, another surge of moisture is coming in. It uh, looks like uh, the YK all the way up toward Norton Sound will still be dealing with some fairly steady rainfall uh, throughout a good part of Thursday. A lot of that will stretch northward to the uh, Chukchi and Beaufort Sea Coast. Cold air is dropping out of the uh, eastern parts of Siberia, and with that we'll watch for another reinforcing shot of precipitation perhaps later on in the week and the early weekend. A ridge of high pressure still protecting a large part of southeast, so your dry days by and large will continue there. And you'll notice some warmer air building here across the south and western Gulf. We'll have to see how far north that travels as we head toward uh, Friday. But for right now, things will be drying out across parts of Prince William Sound. Uh, the eastern Alaska Range and part of the interior, though, we'll keep an eye on a potential thunderstorm development across the Alcan there as we go toward the end of the week. Here's a look at temperatures today for southeast. Readings were in the mid to upper 50s, uh, low to mid 60s there for Hyder. Elsewhere, just about everywhere across southeast made it into the mid to upper 50s, including places like Petersburg, Wrangell, Gustavus, Juneau, 56, 55 around Hain Haines and Skagway, Metlakotla and Ketchikan, all fairly mild today. Prince William Sound, a little bit cooler with rain in the area. Whittier down to 49 by late afternoon, 52 in Kenai, 50 in Anchorage. A fairly wet day around the Anchorage Bowl, 48 around Talkeetna. Areas around Glen Allen and northward were in the 50s to lower 60s. Northway, Eagle 62, Fairbanks 61. Healy was 53, Greeley a warmer 60 degrees, 58 around Tanana, Fort Yukon looking at lower 60s there. Anaktuvik Pass was 52 with Arctic Village at 61. The Arctic Coast only in the mid-30s today. In fact, Barrow barely made it above freezing at 33. Kotzebue Sound temperatures in the mid to upper 30s with uh, Kivalina and many areas around Shishmaref uh, in the upper 30s there. Once you get inland toward Ambler, uh, it was uh, much warmer, 55 degrees, 48 around Nome. Uh, 50 around the YK coast, all the way down to 43 at Nunavak Island, 45 in Bethel, and temperatures around Bristol Bay were hovering in the mid to upper 40s with most of the Alaska Peninsula very close to, if not just a hair below 50 degrees, 52 in Kodiak. The Pribilofs in the mid 40s today, 52 around Unalaska and Dutch Harbor, and low to mid 40s for the west and central parts of the chain. Overnight low temperatures will remain mild across the eastern interior. Everywhere else, likely in the upper 30s and lower 40s. South of the Alaska Range, low to mid 
40s there. A homer could be a little bit cooler in the 30s, perhaps. The Alaska Peninsula generally in the lower 40s, as will be most of the chain. The YK Delta may dip into the mid to upper 30s tonight. 35 in Nome. Uh, the Chukchi Seacoast looking at low 30s and close to freezing for the Beaufort Seacoast. For most of southeast, expect overnight lows in the mid to upper 40s. High temperatures tomorrow, then back in the lower 60s for a good part of the interior. The eastern interior and the upper Yukon likely uh, pushing the mid 60s there. Southeast, upper 50s and low 60s. South Central and Prince William Sound, probably upper 50s. Talkeetna could be a little bit warmer. 53 in Kodiak, lower 50s for the Alaska Peninsula. And in the 40s again for the chain with the Pribilong at 46. Uh, the YK and a good uh, large area around Bethel, probably upper 40s to lower 50s, depending on how much rain you see, and 45 there in Nome. Flying weather then, IFR is expected across most of coastal areas for the YK up toward Norton Sound, where that may become a little bit more of MVFR. Grazing the uh, Seward Peninsula coastline and then IFR conditions through the Bering Strait and a large part of the Pribilogs as well. And then MVFR lingering across the southeast coast with patchy MVFR mainly in the morning across some of the higher terrain. A lot of that will clear out a little bit as we get into the afternoon. Here's your pass conditions. Expect convective weather to develop during the afternoon for Anaktuvik and Adigan Pass. We'll call that MVFR tomorrow. A Lake Clark and Merrill Pass should see improvements throughout the day. Rainy Pass expected to be VFR by the afternoon. Windy Pass probably MVFR trending toward visual during the day. Visible uh, Isabel Pass should be Visible Pass by late afternoon. VFR there. Mentasta Pass MV, or VFR conditions there. Tanita Pass we expect to see some improvements during your Wednesday. Portage Pass should also see some improvement, but watch for some convective showers during the afternoon. Chilkoot and White Pass, right now we're going to call VFR uh, for the midweek. Freezing levels show that overrunning taking place across the Bering Strait. You can see the 2,000 foot freezing line here dropping southward all the way down toward almost Nunavak Island. A 4 and 6,000 foot freezing line covering up the uh, central chain. And then we've got a pocket of cooler air sitting here across the Wrangell St. Elias region. Other than that, uh, pretty standard stuff. You can see the effects of that low pressure system dragging in that colder air from the west and then pushing the much warmer weather northward into the Yukon and parts of southeast. Icing potential remains light to isolated moderate. Uh, we see uh, potential for convective weather again across the upper Yukon and the south facing slopes of the Brooks Range. Other than that, it's below 12,000 feet to about uh, 6,000 feet and above, uh, probably below 10,000 feet across southwest Alaska, including Kodiak and the eastern part of the chain tomorrow. Again, most of that should be light to isolated moderate, but there certainly is a plenty of cold air dropping into that and uh, plenty of moisture to work with for some icing threats. The jet stream has several waves of low pressure rotating around this overall trough that's sitting across the bearing. We've got the moisture pump in place coming in from the Pacific. That's pushing in a lot of moisture into the, especially the western half of Alaska. And some of that certainly is reaching south central and Kodiak. We also have another enhancing area of low pressure that's already inside Alaska. And that's kind of stirring it up just a little bit more. So a little bit of the, the main moisture pattern here and the cold air wrapping in. And then of course we've got that enhancing lift from low pressure stirring things up just a little bit more. At 9,000 feet you can see our ridge that's protecting southeast with winds around 20 knots or so. A southwesterly flow into the interior also around 20 knots and then our low pressure system south and west of St. Matthew still just west of the Pribilof Islands. More of a northerly flow on the west side of the storm more of a southerly flow a little bit faster coming into south and western sections of Alaska between 10 to as high as 40 knots. At 3,000 feet, winds remain fairly light across southeast, about 5 to 15 knots here. Winds a little bit stronger along the coast. Low pressure coming in across the Yukon Valley, anywhere from 10 to about 20 knots. And a southerly flow working up the YK coast between 15 and about 20 knots. And westerlies moving over the central chain about 20 to 35 knots. This all at 3,000 feet. Turbulence potential then seems pretty limited at this point. We don't have any major things that are going to really stir up the air or create an awful lot of wind here. One potential trouble spot might be around the eastern part of the chain and the very southern tip of the Alaska Peninsula, generally below 3,000 feet, where we've got a little bit of a stronger flow meeting up with a trough of low pressure crossing over some rough terrain at that area. So we drew in a little bit of occasional moderate there. Uh, generally speaking, light to isolated moderate should probably cover it, but that will mostly be below about 3,000 feet. And you might run into a little bit of chop there east of Kotzebue Sound across the Noatak and Kobuk River Valleys. Let's look at your aviation forecast. I'll be back in just a few minutes with your marine weather. Stay tuned. Our safety goal of landscaping and maintenance is very simple. Reduce the amount of fuel immediately surrounding your home. However, this doesn't mean your landscape has to be barren. 
Some plants are more fire resistive than others. One of the most important things any wildland homeowner can do is to create a safety zone or fire break around the house using these fire resistive plants. And there was still some brush that was potentially close enough that could have caused my house to go up if I hadn't taken that out. So it's just keeping that perimeter wide and keeping it free and the cheatgrass down very, very low, I think is what saved my, my home. It gave the firefighters the perimeter that they needed to get up in here and even do whatever defense they, they could do to help for, you know, any, uh, any potential engagement with the fire. Because at least they had some room to work. Your safety zone can consist of numerous varieties of plants, including grasses, border plantings, flowers, and vegetables. Check with your local fire officials about the best species for your area. In most areas, a safety zone should be cleared away from your home for a distance of not less than 30 feet. As the slope of the lot increases, additional clearance as far out as 100 feet may be necessary. Clearance also depends on vegetative conditions that provide ladder fuels that enable fire to climb into trees. Trees and shrubs are fine as long as dead or low-hanging branches are removed and the height of ground vegetation is controlled. Be sure to remove all tree limbs around your chimney as well as any dead branches that may hang over the roof. Accumulated leaves, needles, and other dead vegetation should also be removed. Beyond 100 feet from the house, dead wood and older trees should be removed or thinned. Consult with your local fire officials for specific guidelines appropriate for your location. Keep an eye on any limbs that may come in contact with power lines. If you're not equipped to trim them yourself, call the power company and let them know about the hazard. When it comes to routine maintenance, remember to sweep your gutters, eaves, and roof on a regular basis, especially during the hot, dry weather of the fire season. Tender, dry needles and leaves are a fire waiting to happen. Although it's very convenient to stack firewood under the porch or under the eaves, it's not in your best interest to do so. To say the least, you're inviting trouble. Stack your firewood well away from anything that's combustible, including fences and outbuildings. Outdoor incinerators or burning barrels for household trash are illegal in many areas because they generate wind-blown sparks. If they are allowed, a permit is usually required, so you need to check with your local fire protection agency about laws and ordinances. Your home should have at least two ground level doors as safety exits in case of fire. And each room should have at least two means of escape, including a door and a window leading to the outside. This is especially true in bedrooms. Install as many smoke detectors as local regulations require and ask your fire officials to help you plan and rehearse a home fire escape drill. Regular home fire drills can save your family in an emergency. If you do all these things, especially clearing the safety zone around your house and building a fire safe roof, you have an excellent chance of protecting your home and family against wildfire. But can these simple precautions really yield such dramatic results? Yes. In fact, the real life experiences of those who have done these things seem just short of miraculous. Well, each year I'd, I'd taken an ax and cut out the brush and was just cutting that out from around the house in order to make it easy to, to take the, the uh, cheat grass out with a weed eater, a heavy duty weed eater. And then every year I just kept increasing that distance out of, from around the house, never knowing how much was going to be enough. You've got to keep that brush clear away from your home uh, so that the fire doesn't have any t chance to get up against the, the side of your house. The smoke seemed to build up at quite a bit. And then I noticed about 10 fire engines coming up the street. And uh, I ran out with the children and, and said, what should I do? And they said, as quickly as possible, evacuate the house. I looked down at the house, and uh, there were about 200-foot uh, flames almost surrounding the house. And, and I was sure at that time that the house was gone. A few months before the fire, we, were, we heard that you should make sure the sagebrush is cleared away from the house. And, and he just thought, well, we, we might start doing that in case there was a fire. This is beautiful country. It's a privilege and a pleasure to live here. And with that comes a responsibility not only to protect our own property and the safety of our neighbors, but to preserve the resources, the wildlife, and the natural beauty that belong to everyone. 
thank you for taking time to watch this program. If you have any questions, don't hesitate to call your local fire department, Wildland Fire Agency, or State Forester. Your efforts do make a difference. Information and video that stands the test of time there. And music, too. Southerly winds across the Lynn Canal, 25 knots around 3-foot seas there for Wednesday. You'll notice most areas around 3 to 4-foot seas as we go into Wednesday. Generally speaking, though, a northwesterly flow about 15 to about 20 knots will do the trick. The exception, again, around the Lynn Canal. But watch what happens on Thursday. Wind shift ever so slightly, and just about every location sees uh, seas coming up at least about a foot or so. So four foot seas there around Yakutat and then southward six, seven, even eight foot seas heading out toward Craig. Uh, the inner waterways around 20 to 30 knots, four to six foot seas there. So some stronger winds for sure coming down through the Clarence and Chatham Straits and around Lynn Canal. Around, we're still looking at 20 knots, so a little bit of a slower wind. Four foot seas there for Thursday. Around south central, south and westerly flow will be predominant. Inside Prince William Sound, 10 knots with a two foot sea. Westerlies outside of Prince William Sound in the north and western Gulf around 20 knots. Four to five foot seas there. East of Kodiak Island, a southwesterly flow, five foot seas. Southwesterlies in the Shellacoff Strait region around six foot seas. And four to five foot seas inside of Cook Inlet. So uh, still looking at a healthy breeze moving up from the south and southwest on Wednesday. That diminishes somewhat on Thursday. Winds become a little more light and variable around the northern Cook Inlet. On either side of Kodiak Island, you're still looking at about 15 to 20 knots with 4 to 7 foot seas around the north and western Gulf, 4 to 5 foot seas, and winds still relatively light inside of Prince William Sound with a 2 foot sea on Thursday. Across the Alaska Peninsula, south and westerly winds will be the weakest inside Bristol Bay at 15 knots, 20 knots there north of Cold Bay along the Pacific, 20 to 25 knots with 6 to 7 foot seas. And for Thursday, a southerly flow inside of uh, Bristol Bay. Southerly winds also running around 20 knots on the Pacific side, 6 to 7 foot seas there and north of Cold Bay in the Bering Sea, 20 knots from the south and west with a 5-foot sea for Thursday. Across the Aleutian Chain, look for a west and northwesterly flow for the west and west central sections there, 6 to 7-foot seas. Otherwise, south and southwesterly winds will be the rule, 20 to 25 knots on the Bering side, 20 to 25 knots also on the Pacific side, looking at 8-foot seas on the Bering and 6 to 7-foot seas for most areas there on the Bering Sea side. For Thursday, a westerly flow across west and central areas, 6 to 7 foot seas, more of a west and northwesterly shift, though, from Adak to Atka and to Kolsky, Unalaska. Uh, the exception will be on the south side from the Kolsky to Unalaska. You're looking at that southerly flow with an 8 foot sea. Otherwise, 5 to 6, even 7 foot seas still possible across the Bering Sea side and uh, 8 foot seas on the Pacific side. I want to pause real quick here and say uh, hello to all of my new friends out in New Talk. We went out to the village on Friday. And uh, so I'll simply say Guyana, 
Kalaguse. Uh, hopefully I got that one right there, but uh, again, it was a pleasure talking to all of you. And then back to the marine forecast, a southerly flow across the St. Lawrence Island, a 10 knot flow with a two foot sea there across some of the northern bearing, uh, more of an offshore flow, an easterly wind out of Hooper Bay and Nunavak Island, southeasterlies coming up through uh, the Kuskokwim Bay area may push a little bit of water northward. Otherwise, 15 to 20 knots with a five foot sea for most of the bearing. And then look what happens as we get into Thursday. The winds should settle down, but we're still gonna be looking at more of a southerly flow here coming into the Kuskokwim Bay area. And then winds just a little bit north of Hooper Bay become northeasterly. So in that low pressure system sitting right about here, pushing winds again in from the south, though gently about 10 to 15 knots with a five foot sea in most areas. Across the north slope, then winds remain light around 10 knots or so. More of a north and easterly flow coming across the Beaufort and Chukchi Sea coast. A westerly flow coming into Kotzebue Sound, also pretty light with a two foot sea there. And notice there's enough open water now that we've uh, re added those uh, sea height forecasts there, two feet there west of Cape Lisburn and also in the Kotzebue Sound region. Southerly winds making it through the Bering Strait around 10 knots, as strong as 15 knots, in fact, around Kotzebue Sound and still holding onto our easterly flow around Barrow all the way out toward Kaktobik by the end of Thursday. Recapping tonight's weather, rain will continue across southwest in the YK with a frontal boundary dropping south of the Brooks Range. Look for a chance for showers and thunderstorms to continue across the Brooks Range in the Yukon Flats with rain and showers continuing across south central. Spotty areas of showers across southeast, though most areas there will see more clouds than anything else. And across the Bering and the south and western part of the chain, look for more rain as low pressure continues to crawl eastward. Showers and thunderstorms will be back for the interior tomorrow in the Brooks Range. Look for uh, areas for uh, shower activity to continue across the mountains and the hillsides of South Central and across Southwest in the YK and the Alaska Peninsula with southeasting uh, grazing of showers there and more wet weather for the West as we get into Thursday. I'm meteorologist Dave Snyder. Thanks for watching Alaska Weather. These forecasts are to be used for planning purposes only. Call 1-800-WX-BRIEF for a formal pre-flight briefing. Always file a flight plan before you go flying. The U.S. Coast Guard Auxiliary urges you to leave a float plan with a friend or the harbor master before you go boating. Alaska weather is made possible by the following sponsors. The National Weather Service.